chapter of the Gospel of John, and we'll be working there beginning, I think, in verse 26 in just a little while. If we were asked uh, or tasked with the job of finding an alternative title for the Gospel of John, we could no, do no better than the title I've chosen for this message. Behold the Lamb of God. I say that because from chapter 1 through the end of the book, John is about nothing more or less than revealing the truth about Jesus in a wonderfully simple and profound way. Optional titles could be, This is He of whom the prophets spoke, or Come see the eternal Word who is God our Savior. This gospel engages the mind and feeds the soul by painting a clear picture of who Jesus is and what he has done to take away our sin. And so if you are a new believer or someone who wants to understand who Jesus is and why you must receive him to be saved, I encourage you to read the Gospel of John. And when you have finished, read it again and pray each time that God would give you understanding and the gift of saving faith. As you know, John begins by establishing the divinity of Jesus. He is the Eternal One who was with God and is God, the Son who became flesh to live as our substitute law keeper and to give Himself to death on the cross for our salvation. By his death he paid the debt we owed, setting us free from the curse of sin, which is death, and reconciling us to God. Once we were all without hope and without God and without strength to help ourselves, but God, uh, John says in 3.16, so loved the world, meaning people from every race and nation, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish in hell forever, but have everlasting life in heaven. Romans 5, 6 is also a blessed text. And it says this, When we were yet without strength, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Christ, the Holy One, the eternal Holy God, dying for the ungodly. The word describes people who have no respect for God, who in fact speak ill of God and live unholy lives. The ungodly, the ungodlike ones. God is holy and righteous and perfect in every way, and we are not. We are unlike God, full of sin, lacking holiness. We are not righteous in any way. Therefore, we can have no fellowship with God as we come forth from our mother's womb, because He is everything that we are not. And yet he loved us and sent his son to live a perfect, righteous life. And then to credit his perfections to the account of all who look to him for salvation from the wrath they deserve. At the right time, Christ, the God-man, the sinless one, the Holy One, lived and died for the ungodly, for you and for me. Beloved, the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of all who come to Him by faith. And so we continue our work in John's Gospel. Two weeks ago we looked at verses 19 through 28 where the Baptist deals with, where John the Baptist deals with a delegation of Jews sent to find out who he claimed to be. And John responded to them saying, Well, I'm not the Messiah. Don't put that label on me. He says, Neither am I Elijah come back from the dead, nor am I the prophet spoken of in Deuteronomy. And then, Who are you, they ask? And he says in John 1, 23, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah the prophet said. The Amplified Version of verse 23 reads like this. He said, I am the voice of one crying aloud in the wilderness, the voice of one shouting in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. Level and straighten out the path of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. 
And so John was sent to announce the coming of Jesus, the promised Savior, the Messiah. He came calling men to repent of their sin and believe in Him who was already walking among them. Make straight the way of the Lord. If there, was any, if there is any obstacle to the coming of Jesus into a person's life, it is indeed sin. That is the, the whole of our problem. If you're talking about a road that's hard to travel and might impede uh, the arrival of a coming dignitary, uh, in this spiritual sense, the potholes are sin, the mountains are sin, the valleys are sinful. And John came preaching repentance from sin and uh, uh, calling upon uh, people to look at themselves in light of the Word of God and realize they needed the Savior that was even now on His way. And so he is preparing the uh, people for the coming of the Savior. John, John's preaching was a gospel call to believe in Jesus. It was not just repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was pointing men and women to the Messiah, to Christ. Our new material begins in verse 29 where we read, The next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Millions and millions of lambs, as you know, had been sacrificed as directed by God through Moses. But none of them could take away the sins of Jew or Gentile. And so John's announcement is astonishing. Israel was never, share, never had this kind of message shared with them. A lamb that would actually take away my sin. No, the animal lambs that were sacrificed couldn't do that. And they were never intended to do so. Rather, the entire religious system given to the Jews spoke of and pointed to Jesus who was yet to come. Every sacrificed lamb represented or typified the Lamb of God who was to come. The Lamb whose blood would really, actually, and permanently take away the sin and guilt of all who trusted in Him as Savior. The time had come. The fulfillment of all the types and shadows had arrived and John is the one who gets to point his finger at him and say, See there, that person, that man, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of Jews and Gentiles alike. Sinners from every nation under the sun, every color of skin, every nationality are saved by Jesus, not by ceremony, not by baptism, not by eating and drinking the bread and wine. No, sinners are saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing. Apart from faith in Jesus, all religious practices are empty and even soul damning. I draw your attention to Hebrews chapter 10. I'll give you just a second to, to get there. A rather large passage I want to work through there. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. Behold the Lamb of God, John says. You know, your life is never worth a dime until you behold the Lamb of God. Talking to a person uh, this week and they were casting about trying to find a reason for the way their lives have been and the way their lives are and the way they, they thought and react to life, the fear and anxiety that fills them. And they were looking about uh, for a medical reason and, and uh, uh, carrying on and, and just trying to figure out why things are like they are. Well, there could be a medical reason for something, for this or that, but I'll tell you what the central problem is. That person is dead in sin and they need Jesus. 
They need a new heart and a new mind. Their eyes need to be opened, as Michael pointed out in Sunday school. They need to be brought to their knees before God. They need to acknowledge their lifelong rebellion and cry out to Him for mercy. That's the solution. That's the answer. Jesus is always the answer. Well, Hebrews 10, 1 through 4, describes the futility and emptiness of religion without Jesus. For the law, since it has only a shadow of good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, underline it, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered, because the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had a consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year by year. When you have a works-based religion, the very fact that you're told you must repeat this service to God to keep yourself right with Him, whether it's the sacrifice of a, of a lamb or of some uh, produce uh, to God to, to atone for your sins for the shortest period of time, or it's the eating of the Lord's Supper or partaking in the Mass, it doesn't matter. Those things never take Take away sin or they would cease to be done and your conscience would be clear they don't work it it doesn't work all they serve to do is to remind you that you are a sinner year after year and you're not acceptable to God you got to keep doing something not so with Christ. Verse 4, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Jesus comes into the world, He says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for Me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of Me. That's the Old Testament. To do your will, O God. After saying above, Sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law then he said behold I have come to do your will he takes away the first of the old covenant in order to establish the new covenant by this will we have been sanctified set apart from sin to God through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ glory in those three words once for all once for all, every priest stands daily ministering and they're still doing it and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Can't do it. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sin, rejoice in those three words, for all time. One sacrifice for all time. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has four words to rejoice in, perfected for all time. We have had the perfections of Jesus imputed to us by faith. He has gifted us with all of His holiness and righteousness, which makes us acceptable to God. He has perfected for all time those who He set apart from sin to salvation. In verse 3 of this Hebrews passage, we are told that far from taking the worshiper's sin away, every sacrifice was a reminder of their guilt before God. But in Christ, our guilt is removed and we are made right with God. Look at verse 16 of Hebrews 10. <coughs> verse 16 of Hebrews 10. This is the covenant, the new covenant, that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their hearts. Has your heart changed? Has your heart changed as you walk through the day, as you uh, use your eyes and your ears and, and your mind and your, your speech 
your hands and your feet? Is, it, is not the law of God, the will of God in your mind constantly telling you how to live and speak and walk and think? It is, isn't it? He has written it in our hearts. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. I will put my laws upon their heart and upon their mind I will write them. He says, listen to this, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. One day that will be true of me. Right now, I remember my sins. I remember the days of my rebellion. I recall the ugliness in my, my mouth and in my mind and that I entertained with my eyes and my ears and the places I went. And I pray when that stuff rushes into my mind, oh God, make it go away forever and ever. I know I'm forgiven and I, I know that you've made me perfect and acceptable with God, but it still breaks my heart that I lived like that in the presence of my holy Creator. But on God's side, he remembers our sins no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. So don't be trying to give Him something to make yourself right with Him. Jesus gave the ultimate gift, His life and His blood, and He paid the price in full. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now it's important to understand the phrase takes away the sin of the world. It does not speak of universal salvation. Jesus died uh, and that does not but that does not mean everyone on earth will be saved. It doesn't speak of universal salvation. The statement is made to counter the Jews belief that they and they alone were the objects of God's love, and that the Messiah was coming to them exclusively. The Holy Spirit is saying through the Apostle John that the Lamb of God will take away the sins of any person, of any race, of any gender, from any nation, if they receive Him as described in the Bible. Amen. And their sins and their lawless deeds he will remember no more. Praise be to our merciful and gracious God who gave his Son to live and die for the likes of us. Behold, 1 John 3, 1 says, What manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. If you know anything about God, if you're a, a Bible student, if you read through your Bible each year, you begin to understand who God is more and more and more. And if you have the Holy Spirit on board and in your heart and you look in the mirror and you see the truth about yourself apart from Jesus, you marvel. As the years go by, you marvel all the more. How in the world has God consented to save me? How has He given me the life and death of His Son for my salvation? How is it that I can be called a child of God? The title doesn't seem to fit, but it does, because God has adopted us through faith in Jesus. We are His children. What manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. On account of this, because we are the children of God, because He has caused us to be born again, because His Spirit lives in us, the world doesn't know what to do with us. They don't know us. They know our name. They know our countenance. When we come up, they can say, Oh, hello, John. But they don't know me. Anymore, I meet men who I used to be friends at, with when I was an unbeliever uh, in the copper mines. And I see them and I shake their hands and say, How, John, how you doing? But we have no fellowship together. It's not the same. It's not the same. I'm not their buddy anymore. I'd love to be their friends and I'd love to see them come into the family. And I got nothing against them. But they are not comfortable in my world and in my presence. I'm a child of God. The world doesn't know you because it did not know Him. Oh, is that it? 
they treat me like that because they treat Jesus like that. I am in Him and He is in me. And that's why the world doesn't know what to do with Christians. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. All the veils removed, all of the fog removed, seeing Jesus with clarity. What a, what a blessing that will be. And look at this. Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself. Everyone who has come to faith in Christ, everyone who hopes to see Him at His second coming, everyone who hopes to be in heaven by faith in Jesus, they purify themselves. They are always about the business of separating themselves from worldly thinking and practice. They purify themselves just as He is pure. They try their best by the grace of God to live a godly life. Verse 4, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that Jesus appeared that He might take away our sins, and in Him there is no sin. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of believing Jews and Gentiles. If you want to delight yourself this afternoon, look at those Revelation texts that I put in there. It's all, all of those are about Christ as the Lamb. It, it's a magnificent little uh, study. John the Baptist continues speaking in chapter 1 and verse 30. This is the one about whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. That had to be confusing language to the people who first heard it, don't you think? John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus. And he says, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Now what kind of double talk is that? It's not. John has already told us in the first part of the chapter that this Jesus is the eternal Word who was with God and was God and is now standing before them in flesh and blood body. I didn't know him, says John. I couldn't identify him by sight. But that he should be made manifest or made known to Israel, that's why I came baptizing with water. And John testified, saying, I have beheld the Spirit coming down from heaven like a dove, and he remained on him. I did not know him, but God, who sent me to baptize with water, said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and abiding on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have testified that this, this one who stands before you, is the Son of God. What an astonishing statement. What a, what a mind-blowing statement. They've come to see who, who John is, and there's, there's people following him. He has some disciples, and there's people listening to him. And all of a sudden, he breaks into <coughs> what he's doing, what he's teaching, and he says, there he is. There he is, the one I've been telling you about. The one I have said, uh, I, I told you I've been preaching repentance for the kingdom of God is at hand. There is God in the flesh. There is the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. There stands before you the very Son of the living God. Wow. Wow. Although John as I said, was at least six months older than Jesus, he makes it clear that this lamb, this Jesus, uh, his cousin, in fact, existed before he was born. Jesus is the great I Am. He has no beginning or end. He is that eternal Word who was dwelling among us and gave his life to take away our sins forever. John makes it clear that he could not have recognized Jesus on his own and then reveals that God is the one who identified Jesus for him at his baptism. Look with me at the baptism of Jesus for a moment in two texts. First of all, Matthew 3.16. 
Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. And after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him, and behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This John is described as the greatest prophet that ever lived, indeed, as the greatest man who ever lived apart from Jesus. Because of his privilege and the the fact that he is the one that was chosen to point and say, Behold the Lamb of God. He was the greatest and last prophet of the Old Testament era. And God tells him. You know, you you can imagine this conversation, uh, perhaps in the framework of prayer. Father, how will I know who the Messiah is? How will I identify him? And God says to him, the Spirit will come and dwell upon Him. But not only that, there is the Son of God being baptized, there is the Spirit of God descending upon Him, and there is God the Father, the blessed Trinity before our very eyes, and God audibly saying, This is Him. This is my beloved Son. This is the Messiah. This is the Savior in whom I am well pleased. And so John has no doubt. John has no doubt. The identification is complete. And then Mark chapter 1 and verse 9. Mark chapter 1 and verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming out of the water, he, Jesus, saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him and a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan and he was with the wild beasts and the angels were ministering to him. And so John now knows who Jesus is. He can recognize Him on sight. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit both were witnesses that He was the Son of God. After His baptism, Jesus left John and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. Read Matthew chapter 4 if you want to see the details there. There are great lessons to be learned as you see how Jesus responds to the temptation of the evil one. What's he do? Do you recall? He quotes scripture. He pulls out the sword of the Spirit just like we must. And he defends himself against the devil. That's how you resist the devil that he might flee from you. You stand on the truth of God's word. It was immediately after his wilderness temptation that Jesus walked into the presence of John the Baptist once again to be identified by him in our text as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of all who come to him by faith. And so Jesus has been put through the ringer, as it were, spiritually speaking. And of course, He went through all of that temptation without sin. And here He comes, walking up to John. The word behold simply means see. Look at this man. Take it in. He is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world for the uh, salvation of sinners. Look to Him and live. Isn't that a precious phrase? Look to Him and live. You know, when we're talking to people about uh, Christ and about their need of salvation, this is one of the things that we can say. This is an illustration we can use. Look to Him. Meaning, look away from yourself. Look away from the world. Turn your back on every other hope and look into the face of Jesus. He is the Savior of all who come to Him by faith. Look to Jesus and live. 
And the question is, I suppose, have you beheld the Lamb? Have you called out to Him for salvation? Have you let go of this world and all your vain opinions to embrace the Jesus that the two Johns describe as the eternal living Word, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the God-Man, Jesus Christ? Have you thrown your arms around Him and do you hold Him tight to your breast? And do you love His Word and His people and His church? That's the question, isn't it? Have you embraced Christ? Behold the Lamb and live. If you have not embraced Jesus, I hope you will attend this entire series of sermons as we walk through John's Gospel. All he's going to do, and therefore all I can do, is preach Jesus from chapter 1 all the way to the end. And I am delighted to do so. Yes. I hope you will attend the entire series and I pray that God will uh, bless you with the gifts of repentance and faith for the salvation of your never dying soul. So many today are like the Jews were in Christ's day. All caught up in the idea that you had to behave in a certain way to be made right with God. you got to do something. Maybe keep the Ten Commandments. Some legal uh, rule that you've got to keep. Uh, perhaps adhere to church traditions. Perhaps refrain from eating certain foods. Participate in holy days and, and ceremonies. The question is always upon the lips of unbelieving men, but they don't want to hear the right answer. What must I do to be saved? There are a lot of people who will answer that question gladly. Well, you need to follow me, and you need to do things my way, and you need to uh, keep these rules, and, and so on and so forth. But Jesus corrects our thinking in John 6, 26 through 29, where some Jews have followed Jesus to the other side of the sea near Tiberias. Our Lord had just fed over 5,000 people, and they wanted another free meal. Let's listen in on the conversation. Look at John chapter 6 and verse 26, if you would. John chapter 6 and verse 26. And so here are these, these uh, uh, people coming to uh, following Jesus for the food He might provide and to see miracles and, and that sort of thing. And He says to them, read the whole uh, uh, context. It's, it's a wonderful uh, thing. But for time's sake, I begin with verse 26. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw miracles, but because you ate of the loaves and were feel, filled. He's, he sees into their hearts. He knows their motivation. They were after a free meal. Verse 27, Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. You don't have to work for this food. It is free to all who will eat, which the Son of Man will give you. For on Him the Father, God, has set His seal. Therefore they said to Him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Their minds were stuck in that works-based acceptance with God rut. What good thing must we do to be made right with God so that God will be happy with us and receive us? And Jesus' answer is the gospel. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God. This is what God requires of you for salvation, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. Is that it? Is that it? Is that the beginning and end of it? I'm all geared up here. I got all this equipment. I'm ready to go to work. I've been working all my life and I'm real tired. I just want to make sure I'm on the right track. Am I doing the right things? And Jesus says, stop. Stop everything you're doing. Stop 
Oh, get rid of all your concerns. Here's the answer to your questions. Believe in me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Rest in me. The simplicity of the Christian gospel. The simplicity of the Christian faith. This is John's message and this is what I want you to keep in the forefront of your minds from this day forward. Sinners can only be saved by faith alone in Christ alone plus nothing. You can't add anything. You don't have to do anything to be saved. And along the way you can't add anything to your salvation. Christ is just as sufficient at year 30 in your walk with the Lord as He was on day 1. You look to Christ. You look to Christ. You look to Christ on your 50th anniversary. What's appropriate to do? Look to Jesus. And keep looking to Jesus. That's it. Behold the Lamb of God. Who takes away the sin of the world. Those of you who are believers in and followers of Jesus. Read that last little sentence with me. And I begin. Upon a life I did not live. Upon a death I did not die. Another's life. Another's death. I trust my whole eternity. (laughs) Is that beautiful? Who is this other? Well, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. The Son of God. The Son of Mary. The cousin of John the Baptist identified by God the Father and God the Holy Spirit and proclaimed by the last and greatest Old Testament prophet and by all who are true to Scripture since. Praise the Lord. Shall we stand together?